Our first lecture this morning is the Roten Family Lecture, and this is entitled Advances in Surgical Resection of Primary Spinal Tumors. Our speaker will be introduced by Dr. Christopher Wolfla. Good morning. Uh, it's my privilege uh, to introduce the 2012 Roten Family Lecturer, uh, Dr. Zia Gokaslan. Uh, the Roten Family Lecture was established in 2002 uh, and is made possible uh, thanks to an endowment established by Dr. Albert Roten in honor of his family. The first lecturer uh, was Dr. Uh, Richard Fessler. Uh, how fitting it is then uh, that this year's lecturer is Dr. Zia Gokaslan. Uh, Dr. Gokaslan was born in 1959 in Washington, D.C. Uh, he returned back to Turkey uh, with his family where he completed uh, his medical school at the University of Istanbul. He did his residency in the Department of Neurosurgery at Baylor University under Dr. Grossman and a fellowship in spinal surgery in the Department of Orthopedics and Neurosurgery at New York University under Dr. Paul Cooper. Currently, he's the Donlan Long Professor of Neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins. Uh, he is a professor of neurosurgery, oncology, and orthopedic surgery. He is the vice chair of the department, the director of the spine program, and the director of the Spine Metastasis Center. Dr. Gokaslan is a researcher and a teacher. Uh, at last count, he has published over 250 papers, three books, 50 book chapters, and has performed countless invited lecturers. Uh, he has over $1 million in external research funding. He is on the editorial board of seven journals, and he has been the mentor of over 60 residents and fellows. But he is also a clinician. His practice is focused on the treatment of primary and metastatic spinal tumors, sacral neoplasms, and spinal cord tumors. Uh, his work has confirmed the importance and efficacy of on-block resection of spinal tumors, and he has developed many of the techniques that are used today. He is particularly, no particularly noted for his contributions related to total sacrectomy and complex spinal and pelvic reconstruction, and he's a perennial uh, best doctor. Dr. Gokaslin is also a leader. Uh, he is the past chair of the AANS-CNS Joint Section on Disorders of the Spine and Peripheral Nerves, uh, but has also uh, lent his services to other organizations, uh, including NAS, AO Spine, and the Scoliosis Research Society. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I present to you uh, the 11th Annual Roten Family Lecturer, Dr. Zia Gokaslin, who will present on advances in surgical resection of primary spinal tumors. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the WNS Organizing Committee and our, our chair, um, uh, the president uh, of the WNS, Dr. Paul McCormick, for uh, selecting me for this very prestigious lectureship. I am very, very uh, humbled and uh, feel uh, very special uh, giving this lecture this morning. And I would like to thank Chris for introducing me for his kind words uh, 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 just a moment ago. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, within the next uh, 20 minutes or so, I'll be able to give you a historical perspective in terms of how the field of uh, the management of spinal tumors, particularly the primary tumors, uh, um, has evolved. Uh, we're going to review some of the classification systems that we use uh, in managing these patients. Uh, we will then look at uh, some of the advances in spinal instrumentation, uh, uh, surgical approaches to the spinal columns, uh, uh, and methods of tumor resection, and finally, uh, we will review the impact of surgical resection on the outcome of these patients. I think this is a very uh, good story to share with you because as surgeons we had a huge impact in improving the survival in this uh, group of patients. Uh, uh, this is the general list of the primary tumors that we see in the spinal column and these are listed from the most benign to the most malignant forms. The last two tumors, namely the osteogenic sarcoma and Ewing's sarcoma, are considered to be uh, the most malignant forms, and these are regarded to be medical entities, and what I mean by that, these tumors uh, are treated uh, uh, first with the multi-drug chemotherapy regimens, and the greatest advances in survival of these patients have been achieved with those regimens. The other two tumors, the cordoma and chondrosarcoma, are regarded to be surgical entities, and uh, what that really means that the adjuvant treatment, typically uh, the radiation therapy and chemotherapy, uh, they are not uh, terribly effective uh, in uh, managing these tumors, and this sur surgery remains to be the only uh, effective tool in managing these entities. 
Uh, now, our orthopedic colleagues uh, for a long time have, long, uh, have uh, known uh, from their experience in the long bone that uh, the resection of these tumors uh, can have a huge impact on the overall outcome of, pa uh, on the overall outcome of the patient. And you can see here there are three different ty uh, types of end block resections during which the tumor is removed in one piece uh, and the margins of the tumor are negative. And the fourth one is the one where the tumor is entered and removed from an inside-out fashion, in an intralesional fashion. And they recognize that the end block resection of the tumor with uh, negative margins can improve the survival of these patients uh, in the extremity with these malignant tumors. Uh, but not until uh, Bertolt Stanner, uh, who is an orthopedic uh, surgeon from Sweden, that some of these prin principles have been applied to the spinal column. He is really credited to be the first one performing so-called block spondylectomy for a malignant uh, spinal column neoplasm. Uh, this brings up to the next stage in the management of these diseases where uh, it became clear that we needed some classification system to be able to communicate with each other uh, to uh, demonstrate the extent of the tumor anatomically in a human spinal segment. And this is the classification system that was proposed by Weinstein, Boriani, and Biagini. Uh, it, essentially a, a superimposition of a face of a clock on a spinal segment uh, to demonstrate the extent of the tumor and also uh, design a surgical procedure during which the spinal cord uh, can be delivered by cutting the bone in this uh, circular uh, structure. Uh, we also recognize the need for that and uh, propose a classification system for uh, spinal tumors involving the sacrum and in this particular classification system, uh, we not only identify the bones that need to be uh, cut uh, uh, using an osteotomy technique, but also uh, we just, uh, try to predict the overall outcome of the patient based on the nerve roots uh, that are sacrificed during the resection of these neoplasms. Uh, now, when you're dealing with uh, tumors that are relatively rare, it's very difficult to get a general sense of the biology of these tumors unless you look at a large population of patients, and this is our effort in doing so uh, using uh, uh, the SEER uh, uh, Registry of Surveillance Epidemiology and Results uh, uh, National uh, Database, and this is a, a cancer database, uh, uh, and we extracted and the information related to primary spinal tumors over the last 30 years and published a series of uh, uh, papers related to that. And uh, our goal in this large population-based study was to understand the overall prognosis of these tumors, to identify some preoperative factors associated with survival, and uh, finally try to, uh, try to develop a grading system for predicting the survival of each uh, histological type. And this sort of shows the data from that uh, database. You can see we're able to extract uh, uh, a significant number of patients uh, with each histology, including Ewing sarcoma, osteogenic sarcoma, cordoma, and uh, chondrosarcoma. And as you can see here, the best survival is associated with cordoma, and the worst survival uh, is attributed to the osteogenic sarcoma, which st still carries a dismal prognosis uh, with a 10-year survival rate of about 8%. Now, uh, with using this database, you can answer some of the uh, simple questions. Uh, for example, if the patient had surgical intervention compared to those who had biopsy, whether or not that made a difference, although you cannot really get any specific information related to the type of surgery employed in a given patient. And you can see here for histological types uh, of all, uh, including cordoma, chondrosarcoma, osteogenic sarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, if the patient had surgery, they typically did fare uh, significantly better than those who had biopsy alone. Uh, you can uh, then go and look at some of the uh, preoperative factors uh, that may be associated with the survival, and that's exactly what we did here. You can see three different histological types here, and what we noted was that increasing age and increasing degree of invasion, invasion outside the spinal segment into the uh, paraspinal compartment or distant metastases affected the outcome negatively uh, in these uh, uh, tumors. Uh, and then one can really attribute some scores, uh, progressively uh, greater scores to these adverse uh, preoperative factors and can come up with a grading system to determine uh, how the patients can do uh, or fare in each histological category. It's very clear that the overall survival is histology dependent here, but how it is in, the, in, his, in, in each histological category uh, these patients do uh, based on their preoperative factors. And you can see, for example, if you have a diagnosis of a cordoma of the spinal column, if you're a young patient, if you have a tumor that is limited to the spinal segment with no extraspinal extension or metastases, uh, and you had a complete resection of the tumor, you have an excellent survival, whereas uh, the survival rates progressively deteriorate as the tumor extends outside the spinal column or you develop distant metastases at the time of your presentation. And this is true for cordoma, osteogenic sarcoma, as well as uh, uh, chondrosarcoma. 
but these uh, uh, registries are not really helpful in determining the impact of a specific surgical treatment on a given tumor. Uh, for that, either you have to have a prospective randomized trial comparing two uh, groups of patients who had uh, two different types of resection, or you have to look at very tightly controlled case series, and this is our attempt in doing so in the sacrum here in this particular paper. Uh, we really attempted to resect every single patient, uh, a patient's tumor in an unblocked fashion with negative margins in, in uh, sacral chordomas and chondrosarcomas. And you can see here there is very clear separation of the survival curves uh, uh, between the two groups. Uh, and if we were able to achieve an unblocked resection with negative margins, the patients did exceptionally well. If we failed to do so, if the margins were positive and properly or uh, immediately after the surgery, specimen demonstrated that the margins had been violated, the patients did poorly. And this was also true when we looked at the primary chondrosarcoma of the uh, spinal column. As you can see, if we got a complete resection with negative margins, the patients did better than those who had subtotal uh, excision. Now, um, as spine surgeons, we would be treating mostly metastatic disease, and our approach to metastatic disease is very different than how we uh, treat patients with primary tumors. And just to emphasize these points within the last uh, next 10 minutes, I would like to show you some case examples in terms of how we approach these. In the setting of a metastatic tumor, our goal as a surgeon is really to effectively palliate the patient. And from a surgical perspective, the type of resection that we use really in many instances would be an intralesional removal of the tumor. Uh, in the primary tumor setting, however, particularly if you're dealing with chordomas or chondrosarcomas, our goal is either to cure the patient or achieve at least long-term survival. And the type of surgical resection that we use in this setting would be a complete removal of the tumor in an block fashion. And let's look at some of the case examples uh, to bring these points. So here's a patient with metastatic breast cancer involving the C2 vertebra with destruction. And you can see the C1 subluxation over C2. And this patient presented with intractable mechanical neck pain. And uh, although the patient has radiographic spinal cord compression, uh, she does not really have any neurological deficit. Uh, this patient's main problem is spinal deformity, spinal instability. And our goal in this particular setting is to palliate the patient so we really have to address the patient's mechanical neck pain. And you can see. We can accomplish this by taking advantage of the modern instrumentation as shown here. Uh, we have an occipital cervical fixation system in place with a plate anchored to the skull and the screws that are attached to the cervical spinal column. This is a technique that we use for basal invagination reduction in the operating room, but this is quite applicable to uh, this kind of situation as well. And it's a two-step process where you apply a distractive force by basically uh, pushing the cervical spine away from the skull base to be able to disengage the dance from the front magnum. And then during the second stage of the procedure, you can see now we are translating the cervical spine with respect to the skull uh, anteriorly. By doing that, you can realign the spinal column, and as you can see, the patient's head is fixed in a Mayfield head fixator, so you are really manipulating the cervical spine with respect to the skull in this particular situation. And again, two steps of the operation where the distractive force is applied by pushing the cervical spine away from the skull and then translating it anteriorly. The modern instrumentation now allows us to be able to do these things in the operating room and to achieve the uh, desired objective in, in this patient. You can see here on the preoperative and postoperative CT scans, uh, the patient's uh, spinal column uh, is realigned. We also did a laminectomy at the same time to achieve some indirect decompression, but we have not really touched the tumor in this particular situation, and the tumor was treated with radiation therapy very effectively, but we did address the patient's mechanical neck pain very effectively uh, uh, in this metastatic disease condition. Let's look at another example here, uh, which is quite different. Here's a patient who presented with uh, swallowing difficulty, has a large tumor involving the C234 region, and the CT guided biopsy of this tumor proved to be a chordoma. I hope I've been able to convince you so far that complete removal of the tumor really would be the best uh, uh, outcome for the patient from an oncological perspective, but you can see some of the anatomical challenges with the extension of the tumor into the spinal canal, and you can also appreciate the involvement of the right vertebral artery. In this situation, we would be approaching this tumor in two stages, first from posteriorly, then from anteriorly. This is the first stage of the operation where there's an extensile dissection all the way from occiput to the lower thoracic spine. You can see already some of the hardware in place, and if you look at some of the close-up views uh, of the area of interest where we did now multiple level cervical laminectomy. You can see the vertebral artery on the left and on the right side. Uh, they are both exposed. And we also transected some of the cervical uh, nerve roots that are involved with the tumor. And you can actually appreciate the tumor coming from the ventral compartment posteriorly here. 
Uh, we now, you can see here, uh, place the elastic sheet ventral to the uh, thickal sac separating the tumor uh, from the front uh, so that when we approach during the second stage of the operation, we can actually find our dissection plane uh, in removing the tumor. And this is the type of instrumentation that is needed to really reattach the skull back to the thoracic spine uh, since uh, at the end of the operation, uh, the two structures will be disconnected, as you would see in just a moment. And uh, this is the second stage of the operation where you need an extensile exposure to gain access to this region. Uh, you can see that we are doing a transmandible circumglossal approach. This is an approach that we borrowed from our skull-based surgeons, and this gives you a beautiful exposure of this area at the craniocervical junction and all the anatomical structures that are important to, uh, to preserve during the surgical dissection. Uh, this is the intraoperative picture showing how the situation is. Before you actually split the sternum, you can see the yellow uh, uh, hook uh, at the top of the slide where uh, that is the edge of the mandible. This is the right-sided neck dissection. The retractors are uh, 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 retracting the esophagus and trachea from right to left, and you can see the carotid, uh, and as well as the tumor. The rostral margin of the tumor is not really accessible to you at this point until you really split the mandible. When you do that and cut the floor of the mouth all the way back to the posterior pharynx, now you have a beautiful view of the area of interest from the top, uh, from the rostral end of the tumor uh, to the caudal end of it, and you can then mobilize the important anatomical structures and resect the tumor by disconnecting the rostral and caudal attachments. And, and this is how it looks like uh, when you look through the surgical cavity at the end of the resection. You can see the uh, close-up view of the carotid on the right Right side, you can see the left vertebral artery, also the thecal sac that is now visualized uh, from ventrally. The reconstruction of this area requires a placement of a cage to fill in the defect as shown here. And this is uh, how uh, it looks like on the artist's uh, illustration uh, in terms of uh, the reconstruction as well as the uh, anatomical structures that are sacrificed during the uh, surgical resection. And this is the pathologist specimen uh, that was now removed with negative margins. And you can see how this really correlates to the uh, MRI scan of the cervical spine and uh, the entire tumor has been removed in one piece. Now let's move to another area to illustrate some of the junctional challenges that we face. Here's a patient uh, uh, with a cervical thoracic junction tumor involving the C7T1 region. You can appreciate a little bit on the axial images, uh, uh, the CT scan, the extent of the tumor. Uh, again, in this situation, I hope I was able to convince you that the complete removal of the tumor is really the, the best way to deal with this neoplastic condition. And here's the first part of the operation, and you will see this theme over and over again in two stages. Uh, but this is the first time part of the operation where we are approaching it from posteriorly. Uh, Multi-level laminectomy is performed at the cervical thoracic junction. You can see the cervical nerve roots and the hardware that's implanted above and below. Uh, and the tumor actually is showing again ventrally, uh, ventral to the nerve roots there. Again, the silastic sheet is placed between the thecal sac and the tumor mass, and the extensive cervical thoracic instrumentation was carried out here as the first stage of the operation. The second stage of the surgery requires, again, an extensile dissection as shown here, and here a neck incision uh, incorporated into a median sternotomy. Uh, you can see the sternal retractors and some of the important crossing structures that the yellow uh, vessel loop there marks the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which uh, uh, we will work above and below that structure, and some of the crossing vessels, the uh, innominate vein, uh, as well as the uh, brachiocephalic artery. And, uh, and then the next step would be here really disconnecting the rostral and caudal attachments of the tumor through the C67 and T1, T2 disc spaces. And we will again cut these uh, uh, areas uh, above and below the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which is marked in the middle of the field. And this is the surgical cavity after the resection of the tumor and the view of the thecal sac and the nerves that are preserved and uh, dissected from posterior. This is the specimen that is removed in one piece. And uh, this is how it looks like when we are reconstructing this area with now a distractible cage again. The current laryngeal nerve is seen in the middle of the field. Uh, this area can sometimes present challenges with respect to placement of the screws uh, uh, in an in a anatomically desirable fashion uh, at the caudal end of the plate. Uh, one can really create a small window between the uh, sphere vena cava and aorta below the vessels, which then allows you to achieve the desired trajectory to be uh, appropriately placed these screws. And this is how it looks like in the operating room. You can see the window that now we created below the subinominate vein. Um, it's marked there with uh, uh, a yellow uh, letters there, or the cable subinominate window, and this allows you to gain access to the caudal end of the plate and place the screws uh, appropriately to that area. And you can see how it looks like uh, in the operating room on the left and the post-operative x-ray is shown on the right side. Uh, here's another example where now we're dealing with a tumor in the mid-thoracic region. Uh, there's a T9, or a lower thoracic region, there's T9 chordoma. 
Uh, this is going to be a little bit different where we're going to approach this tumor all from posteriorly. And you can see uh, our uh, exposure here. We're going to do a laminectomy above and below, and we will cut the pedicles on both sides and free up the posterior elements uh, and try to remove the vertebral body tumor in one piece all from a posterior approach. And you can see in the operating room, the screws are implanted. The, the patient's obliquely situated here uh, from left to, uh, left to right. The laminectomy is performed above the area of interest, and we are cutting the pedicles using an osteotome on both sides. After you remove the, uh, cut the pedicles, you can remove the posterior elements in one piece as shown here, and then we do up a plane between the ventral aspect of the spinal column uh, and behind the great vessels and, and mobilize the spinal column and pass a malleable retract the ventral to the spine. And then we need to cut the discs above and below to free up the specimen. And you can see how it looks like in the operating room. We have a temporary rod in place, and the uh, malleable retractor is passed in front of the anterior spinal column. We also have a stylistic sheet that is positioned ventral to the thecal sac. And you can also see the cut ends of the T9 nerve roots bilaterally. And then we will complete the dissection plane and cut the discs above and below, which would then allow us to remove the vertebral body as shown. Here, here's the, it is coming in the operating room uh, out of the field. And this is how it looks like when you put the vertebral body together with the uh, posterior elements that were removed during the first uh, uh, part of the operation and the whole spinal segment is taken out. And, and this is uh, obviously leaving a large defect behind that needs to be reconstructed. And this is done by using a cage fixation. And here, how it looks like in the operating room at the end of the surgery when this uh, space is filled with a, a distractible cage. And this is the last case example that I will be sharing with you. Here's a patient with a multi-level lumbar chordoma involving three vertebral bodies, a lumbosacral junction. There are some challenges, again, related to this area. Uh, this is going to be approached in two stages, first from posteriorly, then from ventrally. The posterior approach requires an extensile exposure of this region, thoracic, lumbar, pelvic fixation, and, and unroofing of the entire lumbar spinal column and dissection of the lumbar plexus. And this is how it looks like in the operating room, the patient is situated horizontally from left side of the stride to the right side, and you can see uh, multiple rods and screws that are used here to reconstruct this area and also the thecal sac that have been ex extensively exposed. The second stage of the operation is performed through a ventral approach through a midline uh, laparotomy, and we will be uh, then freeing up the blood vessels, the, namely the aorta and inferior vena cava, away from the spinal column, and, and then we, during the first stage of the operation had implanted two thread wire saws, uh, one above the specimen, one below the specimen. These are retrieved during the second stage of the operation, and we can uh, use those to transect the spinal column and remove the uh, mass in one piece. And this is how it, it's going to look like when we take the vertebral bodies out and reconstruct the anterior spinal column. And this is the specimen that is removed in one piece. Uh, and you can see the reconstruction of this area looking through the vessels with a distractible cage in the field. And this is the type of uh, uh, reconstruction that you achieve by complete dissociation of the lumbar spine uh, from the sacrum, as you can see, with a cage anteriorly and multiple rods and screws uh, posteriorly. Um, uh, and you can see how the specimen correlates to the MRI uh, when you compare it uh, in the post-surgical specimen. Uh, I hope in conclusion I was able to convince you that understanding the biology of these tumors is critical in defining the goal of treatment. There's no question that block resection of primary tumors uh, uh, can lead to improved uh, survival in these patients. And uh, in, in recent advances in surgical approaches, resection techniques, as well as spinal instrumentation now allow us to resect these tumors completely with negative margins. I would like to thank you very much. I would like to acknowledge my chair, Dr. Henry Bram, who is sitting in the audience for uh, his uh, support and his friendship, and the previous chairs under whom I had the privilege of working, Dr. Robert Grossman, who trained me, uh, Dr. Raymond Sawai, who gave me an opportunity at the MD Anderson Cancer Center, Patrick Kelly at uh, uh, NYU, who provided the uh, environment for us to work, and Dr. Paul Cooper, who has been my mentor, along with um, uh, Dr. Tom Erico, and many other residents, uh, uh, fellows, and the medical students, and the other faculty that I've had the privilege of uh, working with. Thank you.